Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In my last video I took a look at some crude Roman graffiti that was discovered at Vindolanda Roman Fort in Britain. And in that video I used this picture from the ruins of the fort. I did that to see if anyone would leave a comment of how this room of the fort is somewhat reminiscent of the pillared enclosure of Karahan Tepe, a new hypothesis I've been working on for quite some time. Thankfully, I did get a comment from YouTube user Break From Life who wrote, Matt, 3 minutes 30 reminded me instantly of Karahan Tepe. What is that? Well, I am glad that somebody saw what I saw a long time ago. To answer the question, these are the remains of a hypercaust. These are the pillars, also known as pile stacks when they are made of stacked tiles, which held up the floor. Heat that's generated from a furnace passes through the space to heat the floor of a room or bathhouse. The pillars supported a layer of tiles, followed by a layer of concrete, then the room's floor tiles were laid over the top. Sometimes hollow bricks or clay pipes were in the walls, so heat could flow all around a specific structure. Roman hypercourse are found throughout Europe, and also in Africa as well. There is a fantastic example of a Roman bathhouse in my hometown of Leicester, which you can walk around if you visit the Jewelry War Museum in the town centre. The hot air and smoke from the furnace would circulate through the enclosed area and then up through clay or tile flues and then out. The warmest rooms were located nearest to the furnace and the temperature was regulated by the amount of wood that was fed to the fire. It was expensive and labour intensive to run, as it required constant care and attention, not to mention the amount of fuel. So this feature was only really found in large villas and also public bathhouses. Vitruvius, the Roman architect and engineer, attributes the invention of the system to Sergius Arata, sometime around 80 BC, as a way to improve hygiene and living conditions. It's basically the oldest incarnation of central heating. Or is it? Yes, by now you can probably guess where I'm going with this video. And that's my new hypothesis about the function of this enclosure, labelled AB at Karahan Tepe, a large pre pottery Neolithic site in southeastern Anatolia, thought to be around 11,000 to 11,500 years old. Over the past few months, I have made a number of videos about this site, and thanks to my friend Dakota Wind to the Dakota of Earth Channel, he provided some incredible drone footage of the site, which he recorded in December 2021. This footage has also been turned into a 3D interactive model on Sketchfab, and this really is an incredible research tool. I've left a link in the description below. But enclosure AB has always had me totally baffled, because although admittedly I'm not an expert on the pre-pottery Neolithic, and although I'm not an archaeologist, I have never seen anything quite like it before, in all the reading and all the research I've done. I've spent so many hours thinking about it, and now I think I finally have an answer that not only makes sense, but if correct, it could rewrite history. Yes, that is a bold claim, and it could come back to bite me. But anyway. Recently, I've started taking more of an interest in Roman history. As well as a few audiobooks, I've also been watching some brilliant and informative YouTube videos, one of which explained the hypercourse heating system. And the way it looks compared to Enclosure AB at Karahan Tepe made me ask the following question. Could this be a primitive form of central heating, some 9,000 years before the Romans? Even to me it did feel somewhat impossible, but after seeing all the ingenious inventions at the ancient pre-pottery Neolithic sites, 
like the terrazzo concrete floors, the lime plastered walls, how they made water collection basins, the quality of craftsmanship of quarried stone pillars, water channeling and so much more. Well, should we really underestimate what these people were capable of 11 to 12,000 years ago? I don't think so, and although yes this is a speculative piece of work, and maybe an expert can find a fundamental flaw in the idea, I'd still like you to hear me out, because I think it could be groundbreaking if correct. Admittedly, it's an idea in its infancy. Right now it isn't a well-developed hypothesis, but this is a YouTube video and not a peer-reviewed paper. I want to read your feedback, the pros and cons for the idea, and then just see where it takes me. So first, let's have a brief overview of the main aspects of Karahan Tepe. At the site there are three main enclosures, the largest labelled AD, which is connected to the pillared enclosure AB, which is then connected to enclosure AA. This one is higher and shallower. Their purpose is unknown, but the experts call them special enclosures, and they look to have had a clear function at the site. They are the primary focus of Karahan Tepe, the beating heart of the site. Enclosure AB is the most unusual. In terms of the pre-pottery Neolithic, it's unlike anything else I've seen before. A number of researchers have already given their ideas. Some say that these are phallic symbols, so this enclosure could be part of some fertility ritual or rite of passage. Author and scientist Martin Swetman believes it relates to a lunisolar calendar system. Some say that water filled the enclosure for reasons unknown and so on. I'm not here today to evaluate the different ideas already out there, but personally, so far I've not been satisfied by any explanation. Something that takes into account all the observations made so far in the field. I think that people look at the pre-pottery Neolithic and they already have a particular viewpoint, a preconceived notion of what they think the site is and what they think the people were about. After spending a lot of time looking at the sites of ancient Turkey, I do think that practicality is a reason for much of what we see is often overlooked. I think that these were innovative, practical people, and so maybe that's why we have this unique and bizarre enclosure AB. I should stress that the excavated ruins we see today are just that. Ruins. It's not how the site looked when the structures were first built, and also not how they looked when the site was decommissioned. The structures could have had different phases of use different functions through time, and there were almost certainly superstructures over the top, walls built around them and roofs. There was also likely additional infrastructure associated with each enclosure, and really all we have today are excavation reports and what we can see in the field. So let's take a look at enclosure AB. It's cut from the limestone bedrock, and contains 10 bedrock pillars and one that's freestanding. There is also a human head with a flat top that's carved into the rim on the western edge. The enclosure has an ovoid shape, measures 7 meters by 6, and looks to have a trapezoidal plan with rounded corners. This sort of form and shape is similar to the adjacent enclosure AA. You can enter the building on its south side from the large enclosure AD through a small roughly circular opening. This has a diameter of 70 centimeters, so it is actually quite small. There are apparently five crude steps below. In his paper released in 2021, lead archaeologist Nesmi Carroll says there is also another crude four-step staircase at the other end in the northeastern corner. It has therefore been assumed that people entered the enclosure on the south side, entering from enclosure AD, who then went through the structure and exited on the northeastern side, maybe in some form of ceremony. 
It is a fair assumption, but for me it doesn't quite work. On the western side of the enclosure is a ridge, ledge or bench, and as we already know, there is a human head extending into space. It's turned slightly towards the south. The face has a protruding forehead, thick lips, and apparently a beard under his chin. The top of the head is flat, and there are also two small niches on the bench near the head. The opposite side, the upper eastern side forms a straight line, with rows of stones added to the lower edge to create the finish. Today these stones have been removed, maybe because the archaeologists related the added stones to a later filling process I don't know. They could be later repair blocks, or maybe they were there since day one. Just below the top edge is a horizontal groove, cut into the bedrock, and it continues around on the northern side. Cut into the bedrock to the north of the enclosure and leading into it, we can see a small winding channel. Today a modern walkway restricts our view, and so we can't see its full extent. We don't know where it's going. As stated, inside the enclosure itself are 10 bedrock pillars. There is one further pillar, flat in form with a shallow footing. This has been cut separately and brought into the enclosure. It's difficult to know in which order the pillars were carved, but when explaining them, Nesmi Carroll has split them up in a logical way. What he calls the first row consists of the four pillars in front of the head on the western wall. These four pillars are pretty much in a straight line, with two to the right of the head and two to the left, and all between 1.6 and 1.7 meters in height. As well as being taller, these do look to have been crafted better than those behind, and are often described as phallic in shape. The six pillars behind are shorter, between 1 and 1.4 meters high, and 30 to 50 centimeters in diameter. Some of these pillars are grooved, and they also have a concave top, likely to hold stones on top to make them taller, probably to match the larger pillars. This could be because the bedrock limestone contained defects we don't know. It is clear that enclosure AB had a special purpose. There were no domestic finds inside, and after studying the fill, archaeologists do believe it was intentionally filled in according to certain rules. It was a structured and careful filling process, and was then covered over with flat slabs of rock. So, let's now take a look at the fill. To a depth of 40 to 50 centimeters, there was a reddish buff colored soil containing amorphous flat limestone pieces, each around 5 to 10 centimeters in size. This layer contained no archaeological material. Inside were also some medium sized stones, and these looked to have been put between the pillars and in places lined up. Unlike the rest of the enclosure, the front of the south staircase was completely filled with stones. Large stones were used for this process, and they were placed in a nearly vertical orientation. The enclosure was then covered in a dark coloured fill, around 1.5 meters deep, and this contained irregular and different sized stones, as well as archaeological material. The enclosure was then covered with large flat stones, and they filled the entire space without leaving any gaps. Here we can see one of the large flat stones still in situ at the beginning of the excavation. These large stones were limited to the boundaries of the structure at the top, indicating the filling process was limited to the area covering the structure only. The large flat stones seem to have had a specific arrangement, for example this large flat stone, measuring 2.65 by 1.65 meters, was slotted into the groove on the eastern side. A number of large flat stones were placed in the same section. As a result, it looks like the structure had a lid, a covering that was made up of a number of large flat rocks. 
Interestingly, the six smaller pillars on the eastern side of the enclosure were raised in height by the addition of large loose stones positioned directly over the pillars. The four pillars on the west were taller, so didn't need additional stone. The flat slabs that covered the enclosure rested directly on the bedrock pillars and the smaller pillars that were raised by the additional stones. And this would have stopped the structure from sinking or becoming uneven over time. Basically, the pillars all reached the same height, some with the addition of large loose stones. Then there was rubble and sediment between the pillars. The flat slabs of rock sat on top of the rubble and sediment, but supported and kept level by the tops of the pillars. I do hope that makes sense. So, in a nutshell, that's basically all the published information on Enclosure AB, but it remains a mystery as to what it was. To make any sense of it, we do have to digest all the facts and remember a few significant observations. Firstly, the enclosure is not in isolation. It has a clear relationship with enclosures AA and AD. The bedrock between the enclosures AA and AB does look to be warm, so much so that a stone wall has been erected between the two. We also have to consider the possibility there is more than one phase of work at Karahan Tepe, which may indicate that these enclosures had more than one function in their lifetime. The enclosures of Karahan Tepe could all be multi-phase structures, especially because the wall erected at the junction between enclosures AA and AB looks to sit on eroded bedrock, eroded after the enclosures were cut, but before the wall was built. Another thing to consider is the function of the hole between enclosures AB and AD. It's only 70 centimeters in diameter, and although some people think it's for people to climb through, the small size of the hole actually makes me think it's unlikely. The hole could have had another purpose, some say for water, some say for sound, but I'm going to say that this hole was for heat. Now I'll come back to all these details shortly, but I have to say, even if I am claiming that this was a heated enclosure, I'm not claiming I know exactly how it worked. Because I don't. I'm not sure that anyone can with the level of knowledge we have. And so, in this video I do have to make assumptions. I'm also using unrelated historical examples to help me formulate the idea and there are also many types of historic central heating systems to consider. We have the Roman example. There are many heating methods that come from China, such as the elevated Kang system and the burning cave system. Korean houses use something called ondol, drawing smoke from a wood fire that was used in cooking. This provided floor heating and was still used in the 1960s. In the Middle Ages, Gloria was a central heating system that was used in Castile, and this allowed people to use smaller fuels like hay instead of wood, but it did give the same effect. The point in mentioning all of this is there were numerous ways that central heating systems worked in the past 2000 years. So, to accurately describe how one would work 11,000 years ago, well, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible. So let's see what Enclosure AB at Karahan Tepe has got in relation to the historic heating systems. Well, like the Roman hypercost, we have numerous pillars in close proximity, and we know from the fill that the smaller pillars also had stones on top, to make them all the same height. These smaller stones could have been cemented or plastered to the bedrock pillars. We can assume they were added when the enclosure was filled up, but there is no reason to doubt they were already there, original parts of the enclosure, because the small pillars did have a concave top. There are different layers inside the fill as well, which may indicate that for some time, this enclosure was empty minus the pillars. The basal layer, up to 40 or 50 centimetres, is a deposit of reddish buff soil, distinctly different to the main bulk of the fill. 
Could this be some residue from burning over a long period of time? I would love to see a chemical analysis. What I'm proposing is that these pillars were beneath the floor. So is there any indication there was a floor covering the subterranean enclosure? Well, as we've seen, the famous protruding head has a flat top. A flat top that's level with the tops of the large pillars. So why is it flat? I think it was flat to support a floor. Why is there a horizontal groove on the eastern and northern side, and also a ledge on the west? Why were stones added to the smaller pillars to make all the pillars the same height? I think that this is all decent evidence to safely assume it was covered. What's interesting to add is that a floor added above the pillars would make the floor level pretty much the same height as that in the next enclosure AA, if not slightly higher. The report and excavation photos show that on its discovery, some of the stones covering the enclosure were truly enormous flat slabs of rock. I believe that these slabs are in fact part of the original floor that was supported by the pillars, which had an empty space below them. Space that was filled with hot air, and hence, in effect, heated the enclosure above it. The concept does raise so many questions, and I'm not pretending I do have all the answers. It is a working hypothesis. But even if you're on board with everything I've said so far, the big question is, where is the heat coming from? Well, there is only one possible place, the 70cm hole into the large enclosure AD. In my hypothesis, this part of the enclosure is therefore the furnace, to cook and to heat the large enclosure, and also to heat the floor of enclosure AB. The pillar located here looks to be the most brittle and fragmented of enclosure AD maybe from years of heat exposure being close to the furnace. But also take a look at its shape. This isn't a straight pillar, it's curved. Maybe it once curved all the way round, like we might expect the top of a furnace. We can also see in this picture that the hole into AB is lower than the groove that the floor would rest on, meaning that the heat would go under the floor of the enclosure. In this part of enclosure AD, we can also see a large pit. Was this to store fuel, or something related to the infrastructure of a furnace? As stated, at this stage there are obviously more questions than answers, but I do think it is something worth considering. For example, I've asked myself, why would the iconic face be under the floor level? Well, for all we know, Maybe this was some kind of god to protect the ingenious system and make it work, especially because it did have a crucial role in the settlement. Maybe its face is angled towards the opening to protect it. Maybe it's there so those people that went in to clean it always felt like they were being watched. Maybe it's just something that was done as an afterthought, and there is no deep meaning whatsoever. We simply can't know. You may also ask why there are steps into the area. Well, every structure does need access, for maintenance, cleaning and repairs. The steps are crude and not beautifully crafted, they are incredibly hard to see, and it's not like it looks ceremonial. You may also be wondering, why is there this channel? Well, before we get to that, this room could well have been a shallow pool of heated water and the floor and walls could have been sealed with terrazzo concrete and plaster to stop water getting below and seeping out. This wouldn't be uncommon in the pre-pottery Neolithic. Maybe rainwater ran into the enclosure, directed from the hill on the western side, or maybe some other system that's not been preserved. These marks on the wall could be from water inlets, or maybe they are in fact outlets for the warm air. I do think it did contain water for heating, and it's interesting to note that with the floor in place, there looks to be a well-eroded lip into enclosure AA, almost at floor level, as well as this channel. This channel is not running into enclosure AB, it is in fact running out of it. 
So I think the primary function of enclosure AB was to heat water. I think this hot water went from AB to AA going over this lip and I also think enclosure AA was a bathhouse. There is a ledge of seating all the way round and there is also a deep hole and a small bench you can sit on. You could go down into the deep hole and get your whole body wet if needed to. Maybe this was for hygiene or maybe for ritual. The channel that's leading from AB is taking warm water away in another direction. Maybe into a structure that's no longer there. The modern walkway is now built over the top of this channel. So I can't see where it leads. It's also worth noting these two holes, located in a position where the bedrock rim appears lower. Maybe some apparatus or infrastructure was fixed in place. Before I conclude this video, I just want to address a few other things. The fill inside enclosure AB did have different phases. The later phase is very much a rapid filling process, but the earlier phase is not. I think it shows that this whole system went out of use when Karahan Tepe was still an active site. Maybe the floor was broken, maybe the furnace was, maybe the water ran dry, or maybe for a period of time the entire settlement was deserted. The truth is nobody knows, but I think the decision was made to fill in the subterranean part of this enclosure and cover up the hypercost. The bathhouse AA looks to have been still in use, maybe with cold water, because this masonry wall has been built on eroded rock and it was built to disconnect enclosure AA from AB. Another thing to note, remember how I said that in the fill of the enclosure, the front of the south staircase, which is where we find the opening into enclosure AD, was completely filled with stones large stones placed in a vertical position, well, this in my opinion was to block the hole, to block the heat that was coming from the furnace when this pillared underfloor area was filled in and when the function of the room had changed. This explains the large vertical stones in this specific location. So what do I think enclosure AB actually was? Well, I do think it once had a superstructure masonry walls all around it and then a roof. I think that this literally was the heart of the settlement, like a boiler in a house, heating and then transporting warm water to other parts of the settlement. Was it just a water tank? Maybe, or maybe it was a sauna or a place for a hot bath, or it could have been all of the above, I don't know. But I do think it was a heated enclosure and for many reasons I do think it heated water. Just think how useful this would be. This idea is more of a PhD thesis than a YouTube video, but I would love to hear your thoughts, observations, problems, questions and so on, whether you like the idea or dislike it. I will continue to develop it further and I'll certainly update you with how the idea evolves. If the idea somehow proves to be correct, well it shows that Karahan Tepe has the oldest known central heating system in the world, more than 9000 years before the Romans. That revelation in itself would be truly amazing. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.